So how excited are you about the word that the Lord gave Soma this year, rise up? And we are rising up. If you are aware at all, kind of have your thumb on the pulse at all of the church internationally, um, we aren't the only ones that seem to have felt this call, this idea of rising up, rising up in the truth, rising up in the resurrection power of Jesus that the church needs to rise up. And I love it in Nehemiah, I think it's 10, 7, it says, uh, uh, rise up, take courage and do it. It's a great paraphrasing of that scripture. And we want to rise up, take courage and do the things that the Lord has called us to do. And the past couple of weeks, Tony's been teaching on rising up in freedom. And that's important. And we have classes on Wednesday night coming up in March. If you want to go deeper in that learning about what it means to be free in Christ. My message this morning is an extension of that and really a fulfillment of that. And it is rise up with forgiveness. And that's something that we need to do. And before you tune me out, because I know that's our tendency, before you tune me out this morning and think forgiveness doesn't apply or that's something I don't really want to deal with this morning, I want you to give this message a fair shot. Go ahead and commit in your hearts right now that you might have something to learn about forgiveness. Okay? The concept of forgiveness is talked about over 150 times in the Bible. So if you're reading your Bible every day, that's probably every other day you're going to hear about it. Forgiveness is at the heart of God's redemptive plan. We sit here and we enjoy and celebrate and declare and worship the Lord because we've been forgiven, right? Yet somehow in the church and in and in the hearts of believers, we will quickly pass over that concept of forgiveness as though it's archaic. Like that's just old fashioned. That was, that's for bygone days. Or maybe we just think it's optional. Like as believers, somehow we think to forgive is just something that we can optionally choose. Like I'm going to opt out on forgiveness. It's one of those biblical words similar to prayer or patience. You know, when a preacher, you start hearing about prayer and you just tend to sort of tune out and start making your grocery list or you're like, yeah, yeah, or patience. And it's like, we know it's something that we're supposed to do or something that we're supposed to have, but we just don't take the time to let it really register, really brew on this idea of forgiveness in our hearts. And that might be because we don't want to do the work. It might be laziness, you know, cause they're like, this is hard. It's hard work to forgive. Because we know this, because we're humans. Like, it's just hard. I just, I don't want to have to deal with it. Or maybe it's because we don't want to confront the issue at hand because it's painful. It hurts. It hurts to have to deal with forgiveness. We tend to ignore it and move along. And like Tony said a few weeks ago, we just go along to get along. And that's just not the way that we're called to live at all. But you might be a little more like me. And maybe you think you've forgiven and you thought you've dealt with whatever happened or whatever the situation was. But in reality, you have this nagging irritation in your heart, this frustration in your heart. And you just kind of want to numb it out. Here's what I do know, because we're humans in this room and we're not hermits living isolated on some deserted island. We have all had a stronghold of unforgiveness in our life. And you may think, whoa, 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 that's a strong word. Stronghold, that's for people who are dealing with addiction or, or with major anger problems. That, that feels way too shackling. I, there's no way, no, there's no way I've had a stronghold of unforgiveness. So I want to give you a basic definition of what a stronghold is. And we even sang that lyric earlier, strongholds now surrender. And it's like, well, what is a stronghold? Because if strongholds exist, then we want to make sure we don't have a stronghold in our life. And a basic definition of a stronghold is any wrong patterns of thought. Whatever we're thinking wrongly about that's not lining up with accordance of God's word. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 6 tells us what to do about strongholds. It says, we are human. We don't wage war as humans do. We use God's mighty weapons, not worldly weapons, to knock down the strongholds of human reasoning and to destroy false arguments. We destroy every proud obstacle that keeps people from knowing God. We capture the rebellious thoughts and teach them 
to obey Christ. I want you to notice that unforgiveness is a stronghold because it is in direct opposition to the word of God. It's a stronghold of human reasoning and it's a false argument and it keeps people from knowing God. And the word says you have to take those down. Strongholds need to be taken down. We cannot say that we love Jesus and we love his word and we live by his word and yet live a life of unforgiveness. I'm going to give you a few scriptures because it's important to know what the word of God says about this. Matthew 6, 14, for if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly father will also forgive you. That sounds pretty important, doesn't it? Like we're like, we want the forgiveness of the Lord. And he's saying, well, you need to forgive others, and then I'll forgive you. Luke 17, 3 through 4, pay attention to yourselves. If your brother sins, rebuke him. That's a message for another time. And if he repents, forgive him. And if he sins against you seven times in the day and turns to you seven times saying, I repent, I'm sorry, you must forgive him. Does that look optional to you? Mark eleven twenty five 25 through 26 says, and whenever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anything against anyone so that your father also who is in heaven may forgive you of your trespasses. It's not optional and it's certainly not archaic. It is a now thing for us to do. Now, here's a few things that you might already know about a stronghold of unforgiveness. Now that you understand that it's just any wrong pattern of thought, and maybe the Spirit of the Lord is convicting you and saying, you know what? Uh, Yeah, maybe I did have a stronghold and didn't realize that because I was thinking against the Word of God, what it's called me to do. And you've maybe experienced some of these things in yourself, in your walk, in the hurts of life, or maybe you've walked closely with someone that you know has had a stronghold of unforgiveness. And here's what we know. Unforgiveness shackles us to our offender or to the event. The very person or the very situation that we think we just, we want to get away from, when we don't forgive them, it's like carrying a dead body on our back everywhere we go. It shackles us. We are suddenly chained to the very thing that we have vowed against. You don't believe me? Think about the person that you aren't forgiving. It's like a dead body and the stench is everywhere. Something else that a stronghold of unforgiveness does is it invites the attacks from the enemy. It just does. It's a wide open door. And you might ask why? How does unforgiveness invite the attack of the enemy? And that's because we are in direct disobedience to God's word. We're not obeying him. And now he stands and brings his attacks against us because of this open door of unforgiveness. A stronghold of unforgiveness also works its destruction in every area of our lives. It is like the leaven, the little bit of leaven that works its way through the whole loaf. And we may not acknowledge this. We give it very little thought of how permeating unforgiveness can be in our life. And then we'll go searching for other reasons why we might be depressed or anxious or angry or addicted. And we're not given much thought to the effects of the stronghold of unforgiveness in our lives. We'll look for some other reason why I must be feeling this way. Before we go any further, there's a few things that I want you to know that forgiveness is not. Because Tony and I are well aware we have sat for over 21 years in full-time ministry with people, real people. We've sat in the room with you, and we've heard your real hurts, and we have felt your sorrow, and we know someone has truly hurt you and truly offended you. And we aren't minimizing that. And forgiveness is hard. But here's some things forgiveness is not. I feel like you need to know this because when the Lord is giving you a message, when he's convicting your heart, I think it's important for us to understand what it is and what it isn't that he's saying. Forgiveness is not denial. Forgiveness isn't denying what happened, pretending that what happened was okay. I think so often we try to Uh, avoid forgiveness because it somehow means that we have to say, uh, that's okay what they did. It's okay. It's not. Forgiveness is not denial. 
And forgiveness is not repression. It's not just ignoring while storing. That's what we do when we repress it. We ignore it, but what happens all the while when we're ignoring, we're actually storing up bitterness, anger, frustration. Forgiveness is not excusing. It's not excusing it. It's not shifting the blame. It's not saying, oh, well, the the reason why they did that is because, you know, fill in the blank. And we make some kind of excuse for why they did that thing to us that truly hurt us, that broke our hearts. And this might come as a surprise for some of you, but forgiveness is not always reconciliation. I think this is one of the biggest ones that people struggle with when they have been so devastatingly hurt by someone They think that if they have to forgive them, then that means they have to be back in a relationship with that person. Don't you know that's not true? For some of you, it is good that you are not in that relationship ever again. That's a good thing that that got cut off. Forgiveness doesn't mean that you got to go right back into that toxic relationship of hurt and destruction on your soul. That's not what that means. Because reconciliation requires honest and active participation from both people. And that's just not always possible. It's just not, it's not always possible and it's not always right. The person who hurt you might be dead. And there's no way to go back and reconcile to that person. That's not, but you can still forgive. We're going to talk a little more about reconciliation in a minute. But I think one of the greatest illustrations of what unforgiveness looks like, if we needed a tangible picture of what unforgiveness looks like, there's nothing like the courtroom setting. When you think about court drama, you guys grew up watching Judge Judy. She's front and center, right? The judge is just front and center right there. She's got the podium and her gavel and her black robe, and she's the prominent figure, right, in that courtroom setting. She's the one that's going to levy that verdict. Well, in this saga of unforgiveness, the judge is the true judge. The judge is God. James 4, 12 says, God alone who gave the law is the judge. He's the true judge, right? He alone has the power to save or to destroy. So what right do you have to judge your neighbor? So there is God front and center. Isaiah 33, 22 says, For the Lord is our judge, our lawgiver, and our king. He's all of them. He's the judge, the lawgiver, the king. And he will care for us and save us. He's good. He's a good judge. One of my favorite pictures of God as judge is in Exodus 25. When the Lord has given Moses the blueprint, blueprints for the tabernacle, he's establishing the system of atonement for their sins, the sacrificial system. And from beginning to end, all the way to the Holy of Holies, it's about our atonement with the judge. And Jesus is all over that. And it says in, in Exodus 25, what is there? In the Holy of Holies, it's called the Ark of the Covenant. It's called the mercy seat of God. And where the blood that was poured out, sacrificed, because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. Something innocent had to stand in the place of our crime, of our offense. And that blood had to be spilt. And that blood, some of that blood gets taken all the way to the Ark of the Covenant and sprinkled on the mercy seat where it's made atonement for our sins. God sits on the mercy seat. That's his seat, mercy. The judge sits on a mercy seat. That's phenomenal, you guys. God who is both merciful and just at the same time. One doesn't exclude the other. Isn't that so good that he can be merciful and just at the same time, fair and good, and he takes care of us? That our sins have been covered because of what Jesus has done. You guys, that's like shout worthy right there. There's another key player in the unforgiveness saga. And I think in the courtrooms, in our modern courtrooms, um, he's there. He's just not seen, but he surely felt. And that's the accuser. 
Revelations 12.10 tells us that Satan is the accuser of the brethren. Do you know a bigger jerk? He is such a jerk. He loves it. He just sits. It's in Job, it says that he comes before the Lord looking to see who he might accuse. You just, there's not a bigger jerk, y'all. And that might sit funny with you. Whoa, 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 whoa. Satan comes before the Lord. You better believe it. He has to come before the Lord himself. Do you know that we're not in some epic struggle between good and evil? We're not all on tinder hooks here waiting to see will evil outweigh God? Never. God is on the throne. He is on the throne and he has ultimate power. Do you know that Satan has to submit to him? That any power he has is limited and he's running out of time. But he loves it right there. He loves unforgiveness. It's like, his, it's like he's obsessed with John Grisham novels. He can't get enough. Our unforgiveness is his addiction. He loves to get in there because he loves to accuse. He loves it. There are two other people in the courtroom drama, the plaintiff and the defendant. I never can keep them straight. But the plaintiff is a person who brings a case against another in a court of law. The plaintiff is the person who was hurt, that something was wrongfully done to them. They were offended. And the defendant is the individual, but often a company or an institution who did the wrongdoing. They're the ones being sued and being accused of a crime in the court of law. And so often when we are in a stronghold of unforgiveness, we are the plaintiff, right? We're the one who's bringing the offense before the Lord. And we're saying, this person did wrong to me. I'm aware that sometimes we're the defendant in the courtroom of unforgiveness. That you've asked people over and over to forgive you, and they won't. And you're always on trial because they won't forgive. Neither of those positions are great, are they? Because it perpetually keeps us in court. When we can't forgive someone, we're actually holding them in contempt which is another court phrase, being held in contempt. Contempt means to despise. We're despising that person. We consider them beneath us. We consider them worthless. We consider it deserving of scorn. We, we hold them in contempt. And when we hold them in contempt, we're not just keeping them. We're keeping ourselves in the courtroom. You know, you can't hold someone in contempt and not be in the courtroom yourself. You're in that trial too, as the plaintiff. You don't get to just throw them out there and then be like, hope it works out for you. You're in court too. And when we hold someone in contempt, we're in court and we're continually in the presence of the accuser. That does not sound fun. To have the spirit of accusation always, ever, rolling through our souls, rolling through our thoughts. We will have no rest, no peace, no perspective outside of that courtroom because we're demanding justice. It is us versus them until we forgive courts forever in session. Doesn't that sound terrible? Can you imagine 24 seven having to be in court I had a memory this week as I was preparing for this. I was in college during the O.J. Simpson trial. And one of the, y'all remember that? I felt like it was never going to end. I missed classes because I was sitting in my car wanting to know what the verdict was. And one of the things that I remembered that I, it was one of the first th times I learned about this concept was of the sequestered jury. That this jury that was part of the court had to be sequestered. I mean, they actually had to leave their homes and be kept in a very secure place so that no one would mess with them. And they didn't get to see their families the whole time. They were sequestered. And I'm so aware that when we're in the courtroom of unforgiveness, that we also have a jury. Our friends and our family, our coworkers, 
constantly hearing the details of our case. Can you relate to that? Every time you get with that person, that family member, they're just going back over the evidence, going back over the hurt. Have you been that jury before? We look to them for justice. We go to our husband or to our wife or to our family member or friend, and we want them to give us answers. We want them to, to fix this. We want them to pronounce a judgment. How often do we go to people when we are in a, in a stronghold of unforgiveness, and we want someone to be mad at that person, as mad at them as we are, and we want them to pronounce their guilt? Man, if you've been a sequestered jury, you need to take this message to a friend that's continually playing over and over and over the events of their hurt. You know, um, James tells us that we have an incredible opportunity. You know, the word of God has an answer for everything, for everything. There's nothing in life that the word of God won't be able to apply to. It's pretty fantastic. So he says that you have this chance. There's a chance that can get us out of the crazy cycle of the courtroom. That sounds good. And especially when you realize, man, that I want to get away from the accuser. I want to step out of that jury. It gets us out of the presence of the enemy and free from the stronghold. Look at James 2, 12 through 13. Oh, good, it's up there. So speak and so act as those who are to be judged by the law of liberty. For judgment will be merciless to one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. You know, we get the chance to stop the court and say to the judge, can I see you in the judge's chambers? We get to go before the Lord and plead mercy. We get to say, you know what? I'm realizing now that judgment will be merciless for those who show no mercy. And so I want to plead mercy I want to run to the mercy seat of God and let mercy triumph over the judgment. Let mercy triumph over the injustice. I had a great Sunday school teacher when I was a kid, and she gave us very basic definitions of mercy and grace. And I just want to say right now, if you're not already signed up to teach at Soma Kids, do it. You have an opportunity to impart truth and excitement for the word of God. I'm standing up here about to give you the quotes that my Sunday school teacher gave me when I was like nine years old. You can have an impact in someone's life. So sign up for Soma Kids. It's a privilege to minister in the house of God that way. And these kids are little sponges. Okay, so anyway, here's a basic definition of mercy. Not getting what we deserve. We're just not getting what we deserve. And grace is getting... Wait, hold on. How do I, got, I mixed this up last night too, didn't I? Mercy is not getting what we deserve. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. Mercy is saying, you know, you deserved judgment. You deserved uh, a verdict of guilt. But he overrides the judgment and he overrides the justice and he gives mercy instead at the mercy seat. You want to know why that's possible? Because of the blood of Jesus. It covers, it covers our sin. We get to go in and plead for mercy at the mercy seat of God. Would, Lord, would your mercy cover this? When we don't plead for mercy and demand justice, this creates a huge gap. It's called the injustice gap. There's a huge gap when we are not, not willing to plead mercy, not willing to go to the judge and ask for mercy to triumph over this wrong that was done to me. And rather, we just want justice, justice, justice. So now there's a gap of injustice. And that's the distance between the wrong that we've experienced and what must be done to make it right. We want them to pay. Here's what happens when we ignore God's command to forgive and keep ourselves in that gap of injustice. Our sense of injustice increases the longer it takes to make payment. 
the longer it takes for that person to pay for their mistakes. And we pick the currency. We choose the currency, right? We want them to pay with the currency we choose, but that currency loses its value to make anything right. That's because there's nothing apart from the mercy of God that will make right what was done to us. I want you to think about this. Think about when you've been hurt, and especially when it's been over a period of time and the person who hurt you knew that they had hurt you. You told them, you're like, that really hurt me, and they were refusing to give you an apology. And you kept saying, if they would just ask for for my forgiveness, if they would just come to me and admit that they were wrong, I'll feel better. But then they came to you and said, hey, you know what? I realize I am wrong. Would you please forgive me? There's some consolation, right? You're like, okay, at least they finally admitted. There's a little consolation prize, but it does little to change our hearts. It does little. There's not enough monetary currency in the world that someone could, could have to pay you think about in, in courtroom settings, and I've read these stories before where families have lost a loved one from someone's negligence or for some, some drunk driving or something happened, and they're pronounced guilty, and they have to pay these fines, and they get sentenced to life in prison or maybe even executed, and the families will say, it did nothing to heal my heart. The verdict of that person's guilt, their apology, did little. And that's because nothing apart from mercy is going to heal that part of your heart. It takes the mercy of God to cover it. When we ignore God's command to forgive, our sense of injustice increases as the perpetrator is blessed. You ever been hurt and the person who hurt you just continues to live life to the fullest? You're just wishing plagues would come down on their head. They get blessed. They get a job promotion. They have a lot of kids. Their life just seems great. They seem oblivious to your pain and suffering. And the more they're blessed, the higher and higher the increase of the injustice in our heart. And it's hard. We ignore Matthew 5, 45. It says, for God gives his sunlight to both the evil and the good. And he sends rain on the just and the unjust alike. I've been evil. I've been evil and the Lord sent rain and sunlight. Because the word tells us that it's the loving kindness of the father that leads us to repentance. This is why Jesus says, Bless your enemies. Don't curse them. Bless them. Because we want the loving kindness of the Father to draw their hearts back to true repentance. We want the loving kindness of the Father to draw their hearts to the mercy seat. But it's so hard. Our sense of injustice just increases if we see them blessed. Our sense of injustice increases and so does our separation from God. It just does because he's on the mercy seat and he hasn't moved. He hasn't moved. That's his position. And he doesn't move from his position of mercy, but we get further and further and further from God when we demand justice. We just do. That's why reconciliation is a primary part of forgiveness ultimate reconciliation. I've referred to this, Matthew 11. I tell you, you can pray for anything, and if you believe that you've received it, it will be yours. But when you are praying, first forgive anyone you are holding a grudge against. Got any grudge holders in the house? Anyone you've been holding a grudge against so that your Father in heaven will forgive your sins. You know, when we plead for mercy and we forgive, we've made the ultimate reconciliation. Maybe not with the offender, but with God. Our hearts have been reconciled back to him. We got to close that gap, y'all. That gap of injustice. When we forgive, these three things happen. I think you could all add some things too, but I think these three things 
we can experience right away. When we forgive, we are connected back to the heart of God. We're right back connected to him. It's because we're at the mercy seat, and that's his heart, to be merciful and just. When we forgive, we close the door on the enemy. He doesn't get to be in the judge's chambers. Did you guys know that? When you plead mercy, don't you want to shut the door on the enemy, on the accusations? That accusing spirit that keeps rising up inside of us, accusing everyone or feeling accused by Satan. And when we forgive, we don't just release our offender, we liberate ourselves. We get to be free. You know why? Because court is closed. Court's closed. We can close court. That sounds awesome, right? I'm sure that jury finally, or any sequestered jury, or anyone who's had to just do the Tyler jury stuff, and you're like, you're glad you didn't get picked. You're just glad it's over. Court can be over. We can have a perspective on how to live outside of that courtroom. We can live in the mercy of the Lord. I love Hebrews 4, 16. It says, before I want to set this up, you need to read Hebrews. If you have not read through Hebrews, read through Hebrews. Do it. Work on it this week. We'll get to it in the one-year Bible. But if you were looking for something to read, I challenge you guys, Hebrews, study it. He's saying, because of the work, like I'd already explained, because of the work of the once and for all sacrifice of, of the blood of Jesus, because of what he's done, and hell, hallelujah, we don't have to go make sacrifices. I don't know about you guys, but I'm glad that's not part of what we have to do. I feel like we're a little spoiled. We don't have to do that. And he's saying, hey, because of what Jesus has done for us on our behalf to reconcile us back to God, it says, let us come boldly to the throne of our gracious God. You know, back in that system, in that tabernacle system, only the high priest could go in to that holy place. And that was once a year. But with Jesus, because the veil was torn and he made that once and for all sacrifice, he says, hey, hey, access. You can come bold, boldly to the mercy seat of God. And look at what you get when you get there. We'll receive his mercy. And we will find grace to help us when we need it most. Two incredible things, the mercy and the grace of God. And we're going to need the grace of God, you guys, when we plead mercy. Because forgiveness is not a feeling. Forgiveness is an act of faith. If it was a feeling, we would just stay so far from it because of what it takes to get there. It is an act of faith. It's an act of obedience where our right action not only changes our wrong attitude... It aligns us with the heart of God. It's a, and we need grace. We need the grace of God to walk that out. Especially if you are in relationship still with the person who hurt you. When you got to get along with them. You need the grace of the Lord. And you have to plead mercy and have the grace when the help, and help when we need it the most. We have to rise up in this, you guys. I hope you're convinced that it's not optional. I hope that you are convinced of the urgency of this message. And it's true freedom. It's true freedom in the Lord when we forgive and we live a lifestyle of mercy. And when we trust the Lord that he can be both merciful and just in this situation. We have to take courage and it takes courage to do it very often. I don't minimize that. Some of you guys are walking through some real pain let the mercy of the Lord tend your heart tend your heart in that pain because people do mean things and they hurt us intentionally unintentionally doesn't matter we need the grace of the Lord in our hearts we're about to have a ministry time I really want to invite you guys to stand we have a song that we're going to listen to and you're dismissed after the song we have the ministry team coming up because I feel like after a word like this when the Lord says when you are praying when you're in the house when you are 
communing with the Lord and you remember something's brought up to you. Oh man, that stung. I remember I, I might be dealing with some unforgiveness in our hearts. We want to respond to that now. We don't want delayed obedience. We don't want partial obedience. We want obedience to the Lord. It's an invitation for you guys just to kneel at your own seat, stand, worship. The words will be up there. Minister team will be up here if you need just personal prayer to walk you through that. But also so aware every week that you've maybe come into the house and you've never ran to the mercy seat for forgiveness of your sins. You've never gone to the father, to the judge, and said, I plead mercy over my life. Forgive me. I believe you. You're my savior. You're my salvation. Do you know today is the day of our salvation? If you've not called upon the Lord, this is a great time to do that. This is a great time. So we invite you guys to walk in forgiveness, run to the mercy seat. Lord, we want to say now that our hearts are open and laid bare before you, Lord. We want to obey your word. And if there is anything in us, Lord, where we have had a sense of injustice, a stronghold of unforgiveness, Lord, that we've had a hard time releasing, Lord, we're grateful and say thank you that we can boldly come to the throne of God, receive mercy and grace, your help. Lord, we want to take these last few minutes to run to you, to run to you, Jesus.